Welcome. As Professor Gironke has said, this is the 12th annual African Studies Association lecture. One of the things those of us at the Center for African Studies here at Rutgers are most proud about in the negotiations to get and keep the African Studies Association headquartered here is the agreement that every year when the African Studies Association board comes for its spring meeting, they would do thus the honor of giving a lecture to us from the African Studies Association president. Um, so I'd first of all like to recognize the presence of the members of the ASA board. We are so wave or something. <laughs> Thank you very much. Those of, uh, those of you who have been here more than 12 months will know that last year was a particular pressure in that the, the lecture was delivered by our own Professor Dorothy Hodgson. Um, now, today's lecture is being given by Professor Anne Pitcher, who is a professor of African Studies and Political Studies at the University of Michigan. As um, you will hear in a moment, her Current research examines the question of political, the political economy of housing and real estate. But Professor Pitcher started her academic career, in terms of her writings at least, as a professor engaged with the politics of the Portuguese Empire. Um, she wrote uh, her, her first monograph in 1993 on politics in the Portuguese Empire, which was followed by Transforming Mozambique, the Politics of Privatization, 1975 to 2000, published in 2002. Um, her most recent book, Party Politics and Economic Reform in Africa's Democracies, a subject which is close to the heart of many of us who are continental-born Africans whose countries have undergone the strains of trying to transform ourselves into stable democracies, won the honorable mention for best book from the African Politics Conference Group, which is a section of the American Political Science Association and the African Studies Association. Um, she is currently an co-editor of African Perspectives, which is a book series that comes out of the University of Michigan. But she's here to us today to share with us her current research. The, her lecture title is A Place to Call Home, The Politics of Urban Residential Development in Luanda, Angola, a subject which I hope you will see, urbanization and residential development affects all of us, whether we live in New Brunswick or whether we live in Luanda, Angola. So please help me to welcome Professor Ann Pitcher, the president of the Thank you. Well, I'm really honored to be here, and um, I would like to um, thank you all for, um, for hosting me, and especially to thank Rutgers um, and the Center um, of African Studies um, for, for offering such a collegial and supportive um, environment um, for the African Studies Association and for the Secretariat for all these years. I mean, I just uh, think we are a better, stronger, and happier um, organization because of our um, connection to, to Rutgers. So um, thank you so much. Um, so for the lecture today, um, uh, I am going to focus on um, urban transformation, something that if you've lived in New Brunswick for a long time, you've uh, seen your own uh, city undergo a lot of changes. And many of the uh, interests that inform the change in, in New Brunswick um, have also informed the changes that I'm going to be um, talking about um, today. So there are these parallels, um, as uh, Professor Busia uh, pointed out. Uh, so from Angola to Ethiopia, authoritarian governments, and that's really what I'll be focusing on today, um, authoritarian governments across Africa have launched grandiose master plans for their capital cities. They've financed large-scale residential development projects, and they've distributed electricity, water, schools um, to the middle class and the poor. Given the growing rate of urbanization in Africa, 
um, these efforts uh, are desperately um, needed and they're also welcome. Um, <clears throat> but they also reflect, I think, the aspirations of governments um, in Africa to create world-class cities and the desires of investors, um, like here in New Brunswick also, to profit from um, um, burgeoning real estate markets. Equally, they reflect the complex political motivations driving urban transformation across many African cities. In this presentation, I draw on interviews, ethnography, and survey research conducted in Luanda to analyze the ways in which the Angolan government is relying on urban transformation to engage in what Dan Slater in another context refers to as ordering power. In Angola's urban context, what I mean by ordering power is the use of slum clearance and turbo suburban housing construction to reshape the urban uh, built environment and in so doing to spatially segregate low and middle income residents. Integral to this process is the delivery of free or subsidized housing, um, water, electricity, and schools to pacify urban residents, to reward them or to buy their loyalty. By differentiating social groups according to income, type of employment, and the type of services they receive, these policies attempt to make Luanda's urban residents more legible, more ordered. Um, I argue that although this process has enhanced uh, elements of social control for the government, um, this realization of a new urban dreamscape has backfired, and I'll speak a little bit about why that's the case. Okay, so before the, examining the particularities of urban transformation in Luanda, I first want to just situate my work um, theoretically. Um, the central questions here are why do authoritarian countries distribute, distribute goods such as housing, water, um, and education? I mean, they don't really rely on the vote for legitimacy, so why do they even bother to do this? Um, and to whom are they distributing these goods? And um, what are they expecting to get back when they um, give people, um, when they provide housing or they provide water or electricity? So if you look at this question in the context of democratic regimes, <clears throat> one of the key assumptions in the theoretical literature, uh, in political science from the work of uh, Beatrice Magaloni or Michael Abertus, um, is that politicians deliver goods because they expect that they will be rewarded or at least not punished at the polls. We hope that Trump is paying attention to this. You know, giving, he should give people health care so he will get back a vote uh, down the line, but apparently he hadn't figured that out yet. Um, so, for example, a key policy goal of Margaret Thatcher's government in the 1980s was the privatization of council housing to sitting tenants. So Thatcher uh, believed that by making homeowners of the working poor, like these people she's uh, embracing here, um, <clears throat> that by making homeowners of these people who had lived in council housing um, uh, in Britain in the 1980s that she would get votes um, for them, that they would become loyal members of the Conservative Party. So this is, this is actually the first um, handover of a, a council house to its tenants and they became private homeowners. This, this family right, right here, this, uh, and their two kids. Um, so she made, she made a kind of political um, um, a, a project out of making homeowners out of council tenants. Um, <clears throat> so with regard to more um, authoritarian governments, um, especially those in developing countries, there's a slightly different logic that prevails because they're not um, necessarily um, trying to get votes. They can capture the vote anyway if they're worried that they might um, might lose, so they can rig the vote. Um, um, but they, they still distribute goods because they want to reward loyalists, loyalists like the military or the civil servants, or perhaps they want to co-opt potential um, opponents, um, or maybe they want to distract a growing middle class um, from thinking about broader restrictions on their freedom. So if they give them things, maybe they won't complain about the uh, lack of freedom of expression, or maybe they won't complain about repression. 
Um, so um, these, these efforts ultimately from the government's point of view are, are meant to um, uh, c contribute to authoritarian durability. And for Africanists, this should sound for, um, kind of familiar. It's a variant of this ubiquitous trope in the literature on patron clientelism. So here, um, uh, patrons, the patron, the government is distributing goods, offices, other favors, and um, these clients that they distribute these goods to are expected to reward them in some way. Okay, there's a number of weaknesses um, in this literature on goods distribution that my, um, that my work is trying to uh, address. Um, first of all, uh, scholars um, have examined the distribution of t-shirts and beer uh, at election time, um, uh, especially in Africa's democracies, or they've looked at road building, um, school fees, the delivery of electricity, but they've never really looked at all these goods at once. So the, the, the literature is, is quite varied on how effective goods, uh, goods, delivery, um, uh, goods delivery actually is because they haven't had a situation where they could examine lots of goods being distributed in a short period of time. Um, and um, uh, the literature hardly ever looks at authoritarian regimes um, and, and carries out a kind of full-scale survey because it's very difficult to do um, surveys in authoritarian countries. Um, and housing hardly ever gets included, um, which is kind of odd because housing is the one thing that African governments really um, advertise that they um, distribute um, uh, frequently. And it's also the case that shelter is, is fundamental. So we really should be um, looking at it more carefully. I mean, governments from Ethiopia to South Africa um, in the last um, decade or so have been very busy um, financing the construction of, of public and, and middle class uh, housing owing to increasing urbanization. So um, the other thing is just like the literature on patron clientelism, a lot of the scholarly work assumes that people who receive electricity or water are, are satisfied with those goods and that um, in turn their satisfaction um, translates into um, support, that it, it positively influences their assessment um, of um, government. And in political science, we call this kind of relationship when you're satisfied with something and then in turn you sort of reward the government for giving it um, to you. So when you're personally satisfied, we call that a pocketbook um, assessment of the government. Your, your pocketbook voting. Um, you're voting because your own situation's good, so therefore you reward um, the government. Uh, Africanists um, might see this relationship as basically you're a satisfied client, so you're going to reward your patron. Um, now, in the case of Luanda, <clears throat> I look at a lot of goods. Um, and I show that for two, two of the goods that the um, Angolan government gave in a very short period of time, basically over the last decade, um, <clears throat> that two goods for water and health care, the relationship between satisfaction and the approval of government exists, um, but surprisingly for all these other things that the government's giving people like housing and electricity and schools, it just doesn't seem to, um, there doesn't seem to be a connection in people's minds between getting those goods and somehow approving of government. Um, I argue that Angolans are, are contingent clients. Whether the goods they receive affect their approval of government policies kind of depends on their income, the salience they attach to goods, um, where they live, and at the end of the paper, I explain why Angolans are, are confounding the expectations of, um, of the authoritarian regime um, around the provision of goods. And I also look at the possible implications of this for like other governments in Africa um, that are giving, uh, especially their urban constituents, lots of different um, uh, things. Okay, so let's, um, let's look now um, at um, Angola itself. Um, so Angola is a resource-rich, um, middle-income developing country. It shares a lot of similarities with oil-rich authoritarian countries in the Middle East and um, Africa. It's ruled by the same party that took power at independence in 1975. 
um, the Movement for the Liberation of Angola, or the MPLA. Um, following a 27-year war in 2002 with the defeat of the opposition movement UNITA, um, the government has adopted a multi-party system and has held two national elections since 2008. So it kind of sounds like a democracy, but it's not. Um, the ruling party highly controls those elections. They kind of highly control who um, registers to vote. Um, they keep track of who registers to vote. As a result, people sometimes don't want to register, understandably. Um, and they also control the timing, the whole process of the electoral campaign. They really work to undermine the um, exercise of the right to vote. And so they are really unlikely to lose anytime soon. So winning or losing is not really what they're worried about when they, when they distribute these um, goods. Okay, so what are they doing in Luanda? Here's a map of Luanda, and then the pink part is sort of greater, uh, greater Luanda, metropolitan Luanda as you were, but um, urbanization is increasing, so you're getting more and more um, uh, sort of uh, second cities uh, outside, outside of Luanda. Luanda has seven million people, which is more than a quarter of Angola's population. It's one of the largest cities in Africa, along with Cairo, Lagos, and Kinshasa. Natural population growth and the movement of internally displaced people during the country's 27-year civil war explain why Luanda is um, so big. By the end of the war in 2002, Two-thirds of the population lived in informal or irregular self-constructed housing, and much of the formal housing uh, stock had completely deteriorated. <clears throat> um, estimates indicated at that time the government needed to build about 200,000 um, housing units a year to keep up with the demand for housing. Um, uh, most of the city's population lacked access to a public, a public supply of clean water and electricity. That doesn't mean that they didn't find other ways to get those things. They found private solutions to a public problem. Um, public schools were also limited. Um, Health care was either unavailable or unaffordable. So relying on revenue from the um, oil price boom that lasted until 2014, the government has actively tried to address Luanda's urban malaise over the last 15 years. Borrowing heavily from Brazil's ambitious housing scheme, um, the Angolan government launched uh, a scheme called Mea Sonia Minha Casa, My Dream, My House program, and it pledged to build a million houses, same number that Brazil also pledged to build, um, a million houses over four years. A million is the magic number. Um, this housing includes social or public housing, um, but also housing for uh, the middle class. Um, furthermore, Luanda's master plan, every, every ambitious world-class city has to have a master plan, and so Luanda has one too. Um, and their plan states that they want to create a city of the future, a livable city, a beautiful city, an international city, and in this regard, Luanda is not unlike um, other African urban fantasies um, depicted by Vanessa Watson and her work, in that um, the government of Angola kind of imagines this um, urban utopia that isn't really going to be realized, but they put that out there as a, as a kind of wish or a promise or a, a goal. Um, beyond the ambiguous platitudes, the master plan does articulate concrete goals um, regarding the distribution of housing, water, um, schools, and health care. And these goals aren't buried somewhere in the master plan. Um, they are prominently displayed on billboards, strategically placed around the city, and they serve as promises. But urban residents in Luanda believe that they are going to uh, get these things. So this is the um, housing one, which I started my talk with. Um, and then they are also promising in this one um, electricity, and they have another one for water, and another one for schools, and all that kind of thing. So um, the government has subsequently revised um, the number of housing units that they are promising to provide. It's not a million anymore. Um, but anyway, there's been a massive building boom um, in uh, Luanda, and uh, the distribution of water 
and electricity in schools have also, um, has also expanded. So using um, ArcGIS and visiting building sites over many years, I've mapped about 170 residential projects um, in the urban and peri-urban areas of, um, of Luanda. So this is my effort to map. At this scale, you can't see 170, um, but you can see that all the dots represent um, different housing um, projects. And the, the, um, they're color-coded, so the greener ones are, the dark green ones are in very, very expensive um, areas. Property values are extremely high where it's green. As you move outside of the city, um, the values, the property values decline. Um, but the bigger the dot, the bigger the project. So I'm going to be talking about one that has um, uh, enough units, uh, it has 30,000 units, enough for about 150,000 um, people. So I mapped all of those, um, um, and I haven't really actually finished because there's always more. Um, all right, so we'll see some pictures so you can get a sense. I mean, here, obviously, they're pretending that they have a legislature that's actually democratic, sort of like we're pretending at the moment. Um, and they've clearly uh, copied, um, copied the, uh, the U.S. as well, um, not the color. That's their signature color, mauve or maroon. That's, uh, that's, that is Angola's color. They use that for every government building. Um, so anyway, that's, that's new. Um, this is a new high rise. If you want to buy the penthouse, I hope you have $10 million because that's how much that, that costs. And uh, this is right along, um, right along the coast. Um, <clears throat> this is a, um, a gated community. Looks a lot like um, a kind of high income neighborhood in Florida. Um, and that um, was built explicitly for um, oil workers. Um, this is Quilombo, one of the places I'll be talking about today, built by, the, um, by a Chinese firm and explicitly for Angola's middle class. And this is social housing for, um, for poorer people and for people who've been displaced. So as David Harvey and others um, have argued, remaking the urban built environment invariably involves creative destruction. In Angola's case, like Vietnam, um, China or South Africa or Zimbabwe, the process has entailed dispossession, displacement, and slum clearance. It has included the forced removal of informal settlements close to the city center so that wealthy residents in new luxury high-rises, like the one that you saw in the picture, uh, can enjoy uninterrupted views of the ocean and the Bay of Luanda, which was also redone to the tune of about, I don't know, $250 million. Um, and um, the Bay of Luanda is locally referred to as Miami on the Marginal. Um, so the government has enticed many civil servants and members of the military um, to these new middle-class suburbs on the outskirts of Luanda, um, where they benefit from a right-to-buy scheme to purchase a new house. It, um, the government has equally resettled low-income residents in new um, public housing schemes and provided residents um, with electricity, water, and schools. So now the question is, um, what do recipients deliver to the government in, in return? Or they, what does the government get out of this? You know, obviously they get people settled and they had to respond. It was the post-Civil War period. But are they getting anything else? Are they creating ordered citizens or loyal, uh, loyal residents? So to determine the impact of these um, efforts, um, Um, so to determine the impact of these efforts, I collaborated with two colleagues, um, Sylvia Cruz of um, the University of Cape Town and Alan Kane of Development Workshop, which is an in, NGO in, in Angola. And we surveyed about 400 middle and low income residents across five different neighborhoods in Luanda. Because of the Civil War, this is really the first um, survey of its kind in the country. And I, if there are any 
people out there who've done survey research, I, I have to say, we did not observe all the protocols that a survey, a good surveyor would do because we were shooting in the dark. There's been no census in Angola since 1970. So to uh, try to uh, randomly sample the population was a challenge because we don't know exactly who the population is. No one's actually done that much work. So we're kind of the first um, people to um, do that. They did just do a census. Um, and they have released some preliminary results, but we don't have a um, completely well-developed census to, to work from. So um, this is what we um, came up with. So uh, th these are the neighborhoods um, that we surveyed. We surveyed five neighborhoods um, all together. We surveyed two low-income neighborhoods, one that was very close to the city center, and you can see it uh, you can see that one there close to where the name of the city Luanda is. Um, <clears throat> and that one was an upgraded neighborhood. So they didn't move anyone. Um, they didn't relocate people. They didn't tear anything down. They just upgraded what was already there, low-income neighborhood. The other one I uh, showed you a picture of earlier, Zongo. It's new public housing. It's uh, about 30 kilometers outside of the city. So it's it's, it's, very, uh, it's very far away. Um, many of the residents who live in Zongo actually were relocated there from the, uh, from the coast um, so that those new high rises could go in. So they, they are not happy campers. They got relocated um, from uh, uh, close to the city center. Uh, another neighborhood is a private housing development, um, mostly for the wealthy and the middle class, it's people who built their own or they hired people to build housing for them, but they formed a cooperative to, to do it together. Um, and then uh, two neighborhoods, um, uh, Nova Vida and Quilamba. Um, these are, uh, so these, I'm showing you four. I, I, I don't have a picture of the, the neighborhood that people um, hired contractors to build them, themselves. So that's like the private neighborhood. Um, but uh, Quilamba and Nova Vida were two, are two neighborhoods, uh, two developments that are specifically designed for um, Luanda's middle class. Um, and both of them prioritized uh, government workers or military um, uh, people, civil servants to, um, to live in those two neighborhoods. Uh, Quilamba was financed by a loan from the Chinese government um, that is being repaid um, with oil revenues, and it was built by a state-owned Chinese company. Um, the president of Angola celebrated its completion with great pomp and circumstance in 2011, but then um, people started making fun of it and calling it a ghost city because no one moved in there, just sat there, um, because it was too expensive. So then the government cut the cost of the apartments um, really in half, and then people started to, um, to move in. And now it's kind of like the icon of a new middle class cosmopolitan um, Luanda. So um, there's uh, a lot of findings from our survey um, that I want to highlight. Um, so I'm not gonna give, don't worry, I'm, even though I'm a political scientist, I'm not gonna give you like a whole bunch of numbers or anything like that. Just some real straightforward um, tables. Um, to pull together what I'm trying to, the point I'm trying to make in the paper. Okay, so the first thing I want to point out is, so we, we surveyed these neighborhoods, most of which um, have benefited from some kind of government um, intervention and have received a number of things from government. Um, and so the first thing I want to point out is really, with the exception of healthcare, um, levels of satisfaction with most of the goods um, with the, for the neighborhoods taken together are, are pretty high. And this is particularly the case in Quilamba and Nova Vida, where they made a real effort to provide things to the middle class. Um, Eric Harms, um, in his work um, on Vietnam, has highlighted the appreciation by middle class Vietnamese of the cleanliness and the order of the new uh, suburbs in Ho Chi Minh City. 
And we have a similar finding. Residents in Quilamba, they like the space there. They like the housing. They, like, they have recycling. It's incredible. Um, they have basketball courts. They have schools. Um, the water runs. The lights go on. So people are pretty satisfied in Quilamba. Um, but in the other neighborhoods, too, um, we had pretty high levels of satisfaction with a number of these goods, with the exception of um, uh, health care. However, satisfaction, personal satisfaction or household satisfaction with these goods doesn't correlate with the approval of government across all the goods. Only levels of satisfaction with water delivery and the distance to health clinics show a relationship with evaluation of the government's performance on broader uh, policies. So we're, we, we're asking people about their levels of satisfaction, and then we were also asking people um, well, later in the survey, do you approve of the government's performance with regard to electricity? You know, how well or badly do you think the government is doing with regard to um, housing policy, water policies, um, uh, policy towards schools? Um, so we ask them that, and then we uh, use statistics to establish the relationships. And then um, we also asked people in interviews uh, what their experience was of, of, of different services. So um, what we also found is that residents from different neighborhoods vary considerably in their approval of government policies compared to middle class residents in Quilamba, residents in, in Lar de Patriota, which is a relatively wealthy neighborhood were much more critical of the government's water policies, while residents of Tallahatty, an upgraded low-income neighborhood, um, seem to be a lot more positive. Um, with regard to assessments of government performance on health care, most residents are incredibly dissatisfied, as you can see from the descriptive statistics. And this dissatisfaction is correlated with a very negative assessment of the government's health policy. So overall, People are dissatisfied and they evaluate the government very negatively on health policy performance. Um, I think just as interesting as what we don't see, regardless of whether a resident is in a Quilamba or Nova Vida, whether that resident has a good job or a government job, um, satisfaction with housing and assessment of government performance on housing policy nearly go off and in two different directions. So they're very satisfied with their own personal housing. They're not satisfied with government housing policy. Um, so um, uh, government workers especially, we thought would be very pleased. They're being targeted. They work for the government. They have to have a party card in order to work um, for the government. But um, their evaluation of government uh, policy performance was not statistically um, different from any other group. All right, so how do we explain uh, these, uh, the, this uh, outcome? What's going on here and how does that um, suggest that we should rethink uh, how we think about what goes on when governments uh, distribute uh, goods? Um, all right, so um, if let's just think about these uh, descriptive um, findings here. Let's just try and figure out what's going on here. First of all, it's not surprising that after 27 year war in which little building took place and few social services were provided, people mostly had to provide for themselves, um, that the provision of goods should bring widespread satisfaction, which is what we see in this table. Um, with the exception of health care. Um, many residents lived in appalling conditions. They lacked access to clean water and electricity. They frequently had to purchase expensive water from these private um, water trucks that trundled around the city. Um, <clears throat> and I think because the private substitute for water is, is expensive and inconvenient, um, the fact that people are now benefiting from, you know, these water lines that have been laid and these, these new pipelines that, that they are rewarding the government by saying, you know, we, we approve of the, the policy. <clears throat> um, and we thought that electricity would be the same. There's a number of researchers 
who are finding that governments particularly target certain neighborhoods um, for electricity delivery, and then um, they get a vote later, you know, if they're democratic governments. So the South African government particularly targets ANC constituents for, um, for electricity um, provision because they expect that these constituents will reward them at the polls, and largely that's what's happened with electricity distribution, and there are a number of, of studies that show that, and we did not, we did not find that um, in our um, study. Okay, so, um, uh, so these are some of the things that I want to try to explain about why, um, why we're seeing what we see in Luanda, why does some goods, why does it seem that some people are happy with the things that they get and they, they also approve of government policy, and in other cases, people are very happy with what they've um, received, but they're not rewarding government. They continue to be quite disapproving. So, I think we don't want to read too much into those areas where, where we're getting no relationship, but I do want to say something about the housing results. Why is it that people are satisfied with their housing kind of across the board, but um, that is not, it doesn't seem to be shaping their approval of the housing policy. 89% of the people we surveyed said they were satisfied with their housing, and the government, of course, has spent billions of dollars on housing provision. Um, and although two-thirds of our respondents live in housing provided by government, no matter what we did, um, there's no association between personal satisfaction with the house and approval of government's housing policy. I think this is because whether residents are in Kilamba or Zongo, so that's a middle-class neighborhood or a poor neighborhood, they can see how other people live. They can see the elite live in standalone houses um, in carefully maintained gated communities uh, or in new high rises along the coast. They can see, hey, I was moved and now there's a really nice high rise on the coast. Um, and they can also see and they may know um, people who have not benefited from social housing, who um, don't have the income to move into Quilamba. Um, they may know people who have direct experience of displacement. So their perceptions of government housing policy may be differentially affected by what they see and not based on uh, their own satisfaction. In political science, we would say that they're being sociotropic. They're not just thinking about themselves, they're thinking about uh, their extended family or their neighbors or um, uh, their friends. Um, so if this is the case, um, my work is showing that people are not the kind of dutiful um, clients that governments and, and some scholars expect them to be. Um, finally, I'm confident that the lack of affordable and accessible health care and the consequences that ensue from that shortage are driving evaluations of government health policy performance um, in, uh, in Luanda. So you can see that um, most, if you just look at the red, uh, most everyone except for people in one neighborhood, the upgraded neighborhood, uh, close to the city center, most people are really dissatisfied with health care um, in Luanda. Public health, health expenditures uh, since the war ended, um, they have gone up since the war ended, but they're lower than other countries um, as a percentage of GDP. Under five mortality rates are still very high for Luanda, and rates in Angola in general are worse than most other African countries. This is the point in my talk when I get really mad, so I'm gonna try not to get <laughs> too upset about this. Um, life expectancy in Luanda is one of the lowest in the, in the world, um, and it's lower than Democratic Republic of Congo, which continues to have ongoing uh, conflicts. Last year, when a yellow fever outbreak ravaged residents of Luanda, killing 373 people in a matter of months, many labs in Luanda were not functioning, hospitals lacked sufficient beds for the ill, and they did not have medical teams who were capable of administering the yellow fever vaccine. Yellow fever is one of the easiest diseases to prevent uh, of all the diseases we have. All you need to do is vaccinate people 
and the vaccine is good for your entire life. Respondents from two of our sites live in Vienna, which was close to the epicenter of the recent yellow fever outbreak. In these neighborhoods, as well as Zongo, few public or private health clinics can be found. We, we spent days looking for health clinics. We asked residents, we got residents to tell us what they did. None of them uh, went to local health clinics. We couldn't find any local health clinics. They said they weren't there and we couldn't find them. We went to the Ministry of Health and they refused to give us information about um, the availability of, of health clinics. Um, <clears throat> most hospitals and clinics in Luanda are, are located close to the city center. Residents from our sites reported that it took two to three hours to get to the closest uh, hospital. And when I went to the Ministry of Health and said, we got these odd survey results, you know, people seem to be really satisfied and, you know, you've been advertising that you're distributing water and electricity and houses and we can see all that. Um, but people keep reporting they're really dissatisfied with health care. Healthcare. Now, they could be wrong. Maybe they have a misperception. Maybe they just moved to this neighborhood and they don't realize where the clinics are. Could you show me where the clinics are? No, can't do that. You have to um, submit a written request. And I said, you know, I think I'll just Google this. So right in front of the guy, I Googled it. And this is what I came up with. And so the neighborhoods I work on are, are down here. And this, this hospital is very poorly supplied. Most people want to try to get to these uh, hospitals here. Um, but this can take two or three hours. Anyone who's been in an urban area in Africa knows that the traffic is, is terrible. And they have rebuilt roads there, but um, it's still incredibly uh, long uh, drive. Okay, so I want to conclude here. Um, to conclude, this study suggests that there's a hierarchy um, to goods that urban residents care about in developing countries, and this has bearing on whether respondents link it to policy performance. With regard to housing, I believe that governments don't, um, don't get a political return on their investment because housing is a visible, spatially fixed good. People compare their housing with others all the time. Um, unless governments are prepared to provide housing of a similar quality uh, to residents of mixed income in locations that are relatively accessible, uh, they will fail to receive political benefits from housing dis distribution. This is as true for the president of Angola as it was for the Thatcher government. A council tenant in, U in the UK may be proud to own a new home, but she can still see the difference between her house and Downton Abbey. <laughs> Similarly, a resident in Zongo is aware that where she used to live is now luxury housing for oil executives. Second, in post-war contexts, uh, moreover, health care needs to be high on the list of priorities. It is really the one good that ordinary people cannot find a workaround for. Middle class people can buy generators. Low-income people can um, use gas, uh, they can use charcoal, uh, they can um, uh, get power off a car battery. It's not, it's not an ideal situation. I'm not minimizing the, the uh, inconvenience of finding workarounds for electricity, but healthcare is something that you cannot get a workaround for. Rich people in Luanda fly to Cape Town when they need healthcare. That is not an option for the majority of people in Luanda. Um, it requires trained professionals, which they don't have. They used to hire Cuban doctors. The Cuban doctors have left because the Angolan government quit paying them. Um, it needs lab equipment. It needs, la it needs vaccines. Um, and I suspect that this is precisely the reason the government has trouble providing this good, because you need to train people, and that's challenging in a post-war environment. Okay, and then there are the targets of goods. There's been such a celebration of the middle class in Africa recently, um, but as my study shows, um, they don't seem to be especially grateful to government for the ways in which governments have, have reached out to them. Other studies claim that middle class citizens shift their preferences to higher order goods 
if they get the basics, if they get access to water um, and electricity. And if this is the case, um, I think we, you know, we should probably be thinking about what those higher order goods are. What is it that middle class people in um, Angola want, for example, and what they want from um, my conversations with them is they want more uh, freedoms. They want freedom of expression. Um, so the no bourgeoisie, no democracy dictum of Barrington Moores seems to be operating here. Um, this brings me to my final point. In those countries with entrenched authoritarian regimes, ordering power is both a vain quest and a costly one, as recent events in Egypt, Tunisia, or Zimbabwe illustrate. Residents are not always the pliable clients that governments assume them to be, because they often look back on a long period of rule and they do not like what they see. After 42 years of independence, ordinary Angolans see a lot of broken promises that were made when the regime declared socialism. They see now an economy highly dependent on oil, um, highly controlled by an elite with personal ties to the president. This elite blocks their social mobility and monopolizes most of the revenues from oil, most of the political positions, most of the lucrative jobs, and most of the nice housing. Moreover, urban planning decisions have reserved the historic city center for the wealthy while relocating the middle class and the poor to underserviced peri-urban areas. These inequities breed resentment and stoke a simmering discontent which is only worsened with the drop in oil prices in 2014. Now, this may not mean that Angolans will be taking to the streets, um, partly because if you take to the streets in Angola, you're quite likely to go to prison. Um, but it does suggest that they are not willing accomplice, accomplices in the spatial and political order that the state has so methodically tried to establish. And that is my conclusion, which I just spoke. Um, and thank you. Thank you.